let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Okay. My book originally came out, A Christian Courtship in an Oversexed World, it originally came out in uh, 2003. And in that first edition, now we, we, just, we just published a second edition, but in that first edition, uh, when my sister got a copy of it, she showed it to my brother-in-law, and he said, what is your brother doing writing a book about courtship? What does he know about courtship? He's a priest. She said, he dated more than you did. <laughs> And that's true because he got married when he was 31. I was still dating at 33. And you'll be happy to know that I did all my dating before I got ordained a priest. <laughs> now, one girlfriend, I told her, I said, there's no future to our relationship because I'm gonna become a priest. And that's how I ended my first great love with Judy McNamara in the first grade. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I want, I, I wanted to be a priest until I was a sophomore in high school, and then I was a sophomore in high school, I rediscovered girls <laughs> and decided, no, no, I think I want to get married. And then uh, when I was 33, God rediscovered me and said, you're going to be a priest. And I said, are you sure? And uh, as you can see, he was sure. And uh, I've been happy ever since uh, from that day when I said yes. Now. Um, I want to talk to you, first of all, and I'm going to start at the end, I suppose, uh, and that is about having a warm, chaste courtship. I actually have some leaflets back there entitled, oddly enough, is a warm, chaste courtship possible? And uh, you can imagine that my answer is yes. And so those leaflets and some of the other cards that I will mention to you as we go along are there and they're free. Anyway, our kids would go to conferences, great conferences. They'd come here sometimes in uh, Mount 2000 in, in, uh, in Maryland. Uh, but they never heard, it seemed, and I listened carefully, and I, I, I think I pretty much heard most of these talks. I don't think they ever heard what was unchaste activity short of sexual intercourse. And a number of, uh, of our young people came home convinced that they wanted to be chaste, but it became clear that they didn't remain chaste because some of them got pregnant and some others um, had abortions. So uh, I was trying to figure out what went wrong or what, how we can make this a little bit better. Then I've worked with a number of couples who were struggling with chastity and after many years of little success in helping them reform, I stumbled on an approach that I think has begun to work. I asked one couple to try an experiment for a month to hug all they want, hug for five or 10 seconds at a time, step back, look at each other, then hug again, then hug again. That's called the mega hugs, micro kisses courtship. And they were only to kiss goodnight, tenderly, gently standing up for a very short period of time. In this way, they experienced a real closeness without getting highly stimulated. Well, a couple of months later, I asked them how they were doing, and they told me they had stopped having sex. The hugathon was working. And uh, another couple, more recently, uh, I talked to the young man and uh, suggested this program to him. And he stopped me after mass one day and said, you know that thing you recommended to me, Father? Yeah. He said, well, it's working. We're, we're being chased. And he wasn't having sex, but he was doing other things. So I presume that you all know the sinfulness of premarital sex, but we'll go through that very quickly. For example, in Mark 7.21, from within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, <coughs> excuse me, blasphemy, arrogance, and folly. The word unchastity there is not a great translation. The word in Greek is porneia. It means fornication. Well, all these evil come from within and defile. Okay, but well, what about foreplay? Well, the, the key church teaching on this is found in the Catechism of the Church. It's number 2351. It said, sexual pleasure is morally disordered when sought for itself 
isolated from its procreative and unitive purposes. All right, so the unitive purpose, not to, you know, it's a very theological statement, um, but it has a simple meaning and it's, and it's very precise. Um, the unitive purpose means that there's an existing marital love covenant. So sexual pleasure may be sought only in marriage and the procreative person's uh, purposes, of course, means that the act itself is open to having children, regardless of the intention of the married couple. In other words, it must be a complete marital act. It's not licit to seek sexual pleasure apart from a complete uncontracepted marital act. Okay. Well, the point is, for pe single people dating, it's immoral to seek pleasure in any action since you're not married. Uh, sexual pleasure. Simple enough. But there has to be a little bit more to it than that because some may argue, and some do argue, that they're not seeking sexual pleasure in their sexual encounters, but they're just trying to show affection. Uh, what then would be another reasonable criterion? Well, the nature of the activity. If an activity is, uh, by its nature, highly stimulated, then it belongs only in marriage. So that would include French kissing, that would include touches, touching sensitive areas. A French kiss sends the average man halfway to the moon. Uh, one eighth grader told me, Father, I can French kiss without getting stimulated. I said, I think you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> I said, there is no way that an average man is going to be able to do that without getting stirred up. This is an interesting anecdote from some of my outside reading. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this book called Chastened, written by a woman that has no apparent religious affiliation after having a great deal of sex for many years, she decided to have one year without having sex. And that was her, that's, that's why she have, has the title of her book, Chasen. So she met a guy in a bar and he asked her, may I kiss you? Well, she was intrigued by the very question. She agreed, leaned forward and hands free, they kissed. Her comment was, it was quite chaste, really, if you ignored the tongues. Interesting how we find allies in strange places because this woman has no apparent religious affiliation at all. And from what I've observed, French kissing is the linchpin. If you avoid that, you have a good chance of being chaste. Now, we'll talk a little bit about um, converting the heart. This is especially important for men. Uh, I do have not only my book on courtship, but also the book um, that we did in 2009, Achieving Chastity in a Pornographic World, uh, which is uh, very inexpensive, by the way. Um, and basically, it's, it comes from Aristotle and uh, Thomas Aquinas and Pope John Paul II. It's a good trio of people there. Uh, and that is, if you, uh, if you want to be chaste, you need to present the values of being chaste, the benefits of being chaste to your, your appetite, so you convert your appetite, as if it has, Aristotle said, the appetite seems to have a life of its own. It doesn't, but it seems as if it does. And so if you uh, give it what it wants, it becomes a spoiled brat and insists on having everything it wants at every moment. Now, uh, there are some people standing in the back, and I'm sure there's some seats here. So if those of you who are not in the middle, if you move a little bit toward the middle and just raise your hand and wave people up so they can all get a seat, that would be very, very nice. Very Christian. Okay, good. Uh, so anyway, you present the values, the benefits of being chaste to your heart. Basically, you're converting your heart. Uh, and so I made a, a list of things, and um, I have a copy of the list of things back there on a little card. Um, and this is, these are some of the things on the list. Sex is holy. It's not a plaything that should never be trivialized. Created in the image and likeness of God, I can live by reason, not just by urges, as do the animals. Persons are to be loved, not merely used as objects of enjoyment. That's from John Paul II, Love and Responsibility. And by the way, if you uh, have not gobbled up the theology of the body and found it really interesting to read, <laughs> if you do find it interesting to read, let me know. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get you a psychologist. But uh, it, it's hard reading. But Love and Responsibility is a lot easier reading, especially if you are familiar with theological uh, language. Anyway. Uh, so persons are to be loved, not merely used as objects of enjoyment. I must not treat persons as objects, even in the mind, lest I become a user of persons in practice. Unchaste activity destroys my most precious friendship, that with God, the source of all happiness. Unchaste activity brings pleasure, 
but not happiness. And this is not on the list, but this is something I added. Unchaste activity discourages the quieter, lo quieter loves, such as friendship, affection, and self-giving love, which the Greeks called agape. Okay? Basically, agape means giving of self for the good of the beloved without conditions. Father Groeschel uh, wrote a little endorsement of my book on chastity, the, short, the small book, like a booklet. He said, this is an example of cognitive therapy. I have no idea, I had no idea what cognitive therapy was, but he's a psychologist and he said that's what it was. So <clears throat> I worked with a young man who was on leave from the seminary and he was struggling with chastity and I said, I want you to make a list of the reasons why it's better to be chaste. And I want you to read that list three or four times a day, every day. So he did. And he read it every day for about a year. And at the end of the year, he said, you know what? I have peace now. I'm not struggling anymore. There's no, there's no um, fight, right? Because I'm at peace and I, I'm convinced that this is the way I want to live and that this won't make me happy. And so that's how you convert your appetite. Basically, you remind yourself over and over again why it's better to be chaste and why being chaste will make you happy. And he went back into the seminary and now he's functioning as a fine priest. Now, one of the things that we have to do is we have to rehabilitate the um, beautiful language of affection. And one guy called me up after one of our seminars. We had many seminars in Washington, D.C. area um, entitled Christian Dating in an Oversex World. And after one of those, one guy called me up and said, Father, how should I tell my girlfriend good night? I said, well, um, you might put your hand to her face and move forward ever so slowly and gently kiss her once, twice, and give her a big, slow hug, pressing your cheek to hers and feeling the warmth as a way of proclaiming your warm feelings for her, and perhaps say something nice such as, you are so precious. Then say good night, kiss her once more, slowly, tenderly, as if you feel she might break if you weren't careful. He said, not bad, Father, not bad. <laughs> I said, well, it's been a while, but I have a long memory. <laughs> so affection is a beautiful love language. And by the way, when I say that, usually the girls say, ugh. Father, that's what we want. Are there any guys that do that? I said, no, you may have to do some training, all right? But, but men are quite trainable, right? We're, we're trainable. Men are trainable, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a beautiful love language, and unfortunately, the world has commandeered affection into sex. Joshua Harris, Steve Wood, Elizabeth Elliot, they want us so, so they're saying, you know, safe kissing for marriage. Well, a certain kind of kissing, I would agree. But a gentle, tender kiss like that, no, I mean, that's, that's fine. That's beautiful. On the couch for a half hour kissing, no, I don't recommend that at all. No, it's certainly, even if you weren't aroused, and if you weren't aroused, it might be a medical phenomenon, but uh, even if you weren't aroused, uh, it's not helpful uh, for getting to another person. But hugs are, because hugs are short, and hugs are a beautiful sign of solidarity. So, um, you know, talk about the theology of the body, this is a beautiful, beautiful way to manifest oneness with someone. And what we want, really, is we want intimacy, not just pleasure, we want intimacy. So, uh, sometimes the women come in and they say, Father, my husband is an animal. I say, well, did you guys have sex before marriage? Yeah, we did. I said, well, he's probably never learned to know that affection is a beautiful language of love in itself, and it doesn't have to lead to anything. It's a beautiful way of manifesting love. And so I said, go back and try to teach your husband that you want to be cuddled, and you want to be held, and you want to be hugged uh, at times when it's not time to have sexual intimacy. So uh, our most devout wives in the parish were speaking years ago, and I was talking to them about sharing affection and so on with their husband, and they said, oh no, Father, when our husbands get, get affectionate, we push them off. 
because we don't want to have sex at that point. I said, that's a tremendous impoverishment because affection is a beautiful language in itself. It doesn't have to lead any, to anything. Uh, and the problem is, of course, when people date and, and they date according to the culture the way it is, um, basically whenever they have affection, it leads to sex very often because they're all having sex. Uh, amazing how many people are having sex, but anyway. Uh, so affection is not sex and it's not just an intro to sex. And we need to rehabilitate affection. Hugs are important. Uh, Virginia Satir, who is everybody quotes when it comes to uh, the benefits of hugging, she said that you need uh, eight hugs a day for a normal functioning. You need 12 hugs a day for growth and four hugs a day, absolute minimum, for survival, okay? So tonight, you guys can figure that out and, and <laughs> make sure you're up to your quota. Uh, Okay, now one of the things that um, one guy used to do is he used to lie on the couch and put his head on the lap of his girlfriend. And he would hold her hand and kiss her hand and all that. And they would talk and they would have nice intimacy. But it, as long as they stayed in that position, nothing bad happened. So that's, that's fine. Uh, another thing is for a woman to put her head on the shoulder of a man and keep it there for a while. That's a beautiful way of showing affection. When, I, uh, when a woman did that to me, I felt, oh, man, I'm a man, you know? <laughs> uh, it's, it's great, you know? Uh, ask your boyfriend if, uh, if he thinks that's cool. I think it's really cool. Anyway, uh, years ago I spoke uh, in Ohio. Well, we're in Ohio now, aren't we? Yeah, another part of Ohio, <laughs> around Cleveland or Akron or whatever. And uh, a husband raised a hand, and uh, he and his wife had not kissed until they got married. And he said, well, isn't there a danger if a man kisses a girlfriend goodnight, he might have an unintended sexual reaction? I said, yeah, that's possible. Uh, and I, he said, well, after a few times saying goodnight, he might latch onto that and make it his first motive. And I said, yeah, that's possible. He said, therefore, I don't think they should do it. And I said, no, that's not right. I said, because when, uh, when a man uh, kisses a girl goodnight, if he has an unwanted sexual reaction or to anything he did, does with a, man, with a woman that's, um, that's affection, uh, he can just ignore that reaction and, and not give in to it. We don't have to be fascinated by that and say, oh yeah, what can I do? How can I keep that going for two or three hours here? No, uh, this is part of sexual maturity to be able to ignore unwanted reactions to women. And women are always surprised to know how often men have these unwanted reactions. They're always surprised to know that. Uh, this is a problem with uh, fathers and their beautiful daughter, okay? The daughter uh, turns 16 or 17 and she starts to be shapely and attractive and the father hugs her and uh, he has this unwanted reaction and he doesn't know what to do with it. Well, he should just ignore it, but he doesn't know what to do with it, so what he does is he wants to be noble, so he says, I must never hug my daughter again, which is really bad. And that's why we have a lot of beautiful women walking around in the world today who have no self-confidence because their fathers stopped hugging them when they were 16 years old. Men, when you get married and you have daughters and they get to be 16, you keep hugging them. You hug your daughters until they're about 75 years old. Okay, <laughs> okay now, I'm, I'll give you some uh, material from John Paul II, mostly from Love and Responsibility. He said, the ph phenomenon of tenderness, and when he talks about tenderness, he's really talking about affection. This is not, I actually did my uh, license thesis on uh, love and responsibility, and I took his book and brought it to a Polish nun. I said, this world, this word, and I, and I got the book in Polish, and I said, this world that he, word that he translates tenderness, uh, or the en English translator translates tenderness, does it really mean affection? She said, yeah, it does. So uh, he said, okay. So the phenomenon of affection also plays an important role in raising or sub sublimation of the emotions. He writes that we feel tenderness for someone when we become aware of the ties which unite us. <clears throat> its essence is in the tendency to make the feelings and mental states of another one's own. That's intimacy, all right? And solidarity. He concludes, and this is a quote, tenderness then springs from the awareness of the inner state of another person and indirectly of that person's external situation which conditions his inner state. And whoever feels it actively seeks to communicate his feeling of close involvement with the other person and his situation. So that's affection. So he describes the, uh, the expression 
pressing another person to one's breast, embracing him, putting one's arm around him, certain forms of kissing, these are active displays of affection. So isn't it interesting? He is saying, yeah, certain types of kissing are fine. Uh, he considers the origin. He says, affection comes from sentiment, that is eros, eros is the good translation of the word they translate sentiment, and its characteristic reaction to a human being of the other sex. It is not an expression of concupiscence, that is a disordered desire, but of benevolence and devotion, wishing the good for the other, that's agape. Saying in different terms, <coughs> affection is a way of manifesting an emotional love, the condition of being in love for someone of the opposite sex, a way that is rooted in benevolent love, agape love. In this way, it's more sublime, that is, it's higher than eros itself. It's higher than the uh, emotional love itself. Eros, he actually mentioned that in the Theology of the Body, and it's from Plato. Eros is desire for the good, the beautiful, and the true in the other. The desire for the good, the beautiful, and the true. So eros is not, as Freud said, primarily sexual, but it's about the whole person, the whole person. <clears throat> okay, so John Paul II warned that affection called for vigilance against the danger that its manifestations may gen degenerate into mere forms of sensual and sexual gratification. He says it calls for self-control or responsibility. He says there can be no genuine affection without a perfected habit of continence, self-control, which has its origin in a will always ready to show loving kindness and so overcome the temptation merely to enjoy, put in its way by sensuality and carnal concupiscence, that disordered bodily desire. Love between a man and a woman cannot be built without sacrifices and self-denial. Okay, now, uh, <coughs> hugging, they find, is very important in marriage. I sent one of our husbands, whose wife was ready to divorce him, to uh, a um, boot camp for husbands. And I said, how did it go? Did you like it? He said, oh, it was great. I said, what, what, did they, what did they recommend? Well, one of the things he said is I had to hug my wife several times a day. And they weren't hugging. I already asked the wife. She said, no, we don't hug. I said, you got to hug. you got to hug. One man came in to see me. He said, Father, I'm 65 years old. My, mother, my wife is 63. She didn't want to have any sex anymore. I said, well, when was the last time you hugged her? And he said, Father, that was three years ago. I remember because she said then it had been two years since I would hugged her before that. I said, that's not much hugging. I wonder if she doesn't want to have sex with you. I said, now go back and start hugging her. Start with one a day. If you start hugging her four or five times a day, she'll think you're drunk, okay? But you start, <laughs> start slowly. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> so what happens very often uh, with couples sharing affection during courtship is they start out by seeking intimacy, but they end up settling for pleasure. And hugs are primarily about intimacy. Heavy kissing and beyond is primarily about pleasure, and they're not the same. And pleasure is a poor substitute for intimacy. Can the same thing happen once you're married? Yeah, it can. That's why it's important to develop a habit of hugging toward courtship. This is a very, very important language to use in any kind of courtship, is to hug, and hug a great deal. Remember that chastity is not like holding your breath, either. It's a long-term virtue. You need to be chastity for the rest of your life. Well, you say, when I get married, then I can have sex with my wife. Yeah, you can. But all the other women, you can't have anything to do with sex, all right? With your, when you're married, you've got to stay with your wife. So uh, there's a lot of chastity in marriage, too. And understanding how you can have a friendship with somebody without it turning physical. So it, it's important that we understand that we have to develop the, the virtue of chastity while we're single and, uh, and be trained in it so that we understand it. You also need the virtue of chastity uh, when you get married and you have several kids and you want to practice natural family planning. That's a time when you go back to this whole language of affection and this whole hugging thing, okay? So uh, you always need to know, uh, you always need to know the virtue of chastity and it's not like something, like somebody holding their breath. One guy told me, he said, um, he came in to see me and he said, I want to get married and I said, okay, good. He said, um, I said, how long have you known this woman? Three months. Three months? Come back in nine months, we'll talk. Uh, he said, yeah, but I don't want to wait too long because, you know, I want to be chased, and so I'm afraid I'm going to fall. 
I said, no, chastity is not like that. It's not holding your breath. It's a pattern you develop and a peace that you develop being able to deal with your sexual appetite. And you actually, as John Paul II says, you graft reason onto your appetite. So your appetite appears to take part in reason. And so you're at peace with this, and you're not struggling here. And remember, too, that um, you want to connect with the whole person, including the body. Not excluding the body, because that would be dualism, right? Dualism is where you hold you know, the spirit to be good and the body to be bad, and the church never held that. The church always said they're both good, but spirit is primary. So the, w the people that are, have been most hurt by the sexual revolution are the women. If a woman has sex with a man, that produces oxytocin, which is a bonding chemical. It's just a feeling of well-being, but it is a bonding chemical. They call it that, a bonding chemical. Now, men produce oxytocin in their bodies, too, but it's blocked by testosterone. So a woman feels bound, and a man doesn't feel bound. And if one feels bound and the other doesn't feel bound, who has the upper hand? The one who, who doesn't feel bound. And so what happens is sometimes, not always, but sometimes, men uh, treat women badly. And women put up with it because they don't want to have to go out and find somebody else. Well, so what happened was the feminists came along and did an excellent job of identifying the problem, namely that people were not, women were not being treated well, either before marriage or in marriage. Because things, you know, carry over into marriage. Most of these things carry over. So, Unfortunately, their solution was worse than the problem. They decided that we can treat sex just the way men treat sex. And that was much worse than where they were already. And so you have, some years ago, somebody estimated that in the um, National Organization of Women, that half of them were lesbians, so that the breach is complete. So women should uh, insist graciously on good treatment, and they will get it. And women have to understand that in the, in the scriptures, the woman is the prize. It says that several times in scripture. It doesn't say it about men. Men are a prize too, but, um, but that's not the role. The role is the woman is the prize and the men strive to win the prize. And believe me, men, when you get married, you're still going to have to win the heart of your wife every day. It's not going to be just, you know, oh, I've got her now. I can do whatever I want. I can go watch a football game. No. You've got to keep winning her heart over and over again. You may be able to watch a football game too, but you've got to keep winning her heart. So um, this is uh, something beautiful that came out of that same woman, Hephzibah Anderson, who wrote the book Chastened and uh, had that one year of not having sex. She said, as soon as I went to bed with a man, I'd lose any clear sense of perspective. I had constantly mistaken casual hookups for rose-tinted beginnings. However uninvolved I started out, however uninvolved it seemed I was supposed to be, I could not remain cool-headed or cool-hearted as the temperature shot up. To, ad to admit as much felt like letting down the sisterhood. I knew that as a woman, my right to sexual expression was hard won. Yet that ideal seems to have been watered down to become intimacy without intimacy. While it is billed as empowering to be able to love and leave a man like a man, to me, it felt like I was denying a whole set of instinctive feminine responses, forcing myself to conform to decidedly masculine relationship ideals. And what a waste of energy all this weeping seemed. And then later on in the book, she wrote, for a few months, I was so completely under his spell that I refused to see it. That spell was sex. OK, so <clears throat> um, women and Women have to understand, too, that they, uh, they have to be strong in getting out of dysfunctional relationships. Women have a hard time. Men have a hard time doing other things, all right? But women have a hard time getting out of dysfunctional relationships um, because they're, they're very connected to the heart. Men are not as connected to the heart. Men are more connected to other parts of their body, but not, not to their heart. So. Um, it's very difficult for a woman to break up for the man. Now, I dealt with one woman who was dating a guy. They used to yell and scream at each other, and then they'd break up. 
And then two weeks later, she'd call him. I found out about all this from her sister. And um, they would get back together. And then they would start yelling and screaming, and then they would break up again. And this went on and on. And obviously, it was the dysfunctional relationship. And the guy was extremely selfish, and it was just awful. So uh, I asked her, I said, why is it that you keep, after two weeks, every so often, you call him up, and you want to get back together? Well, Father, I don't have much fun in my life kind of bored. I said, well, you need to have some fun. You need to get some fun in your life. He said, I can't have fun. I'm too busy. I'm working all the time. I said, you need to get a new job. So she got a new job. And she started having fun every week. And she broke up with this guy. And a few months later, she met a nice guy, graduate from Steubenville. She married him. And they now have four children. And they're really doing well. And they don't yell and scream at each other. <laughs> That's great. So uh, one of the things that we find, especially on Catholic college campuses, is this whole phenomenon of over-dating, where people have to be together at every moment. My friend who graduated from Steubenville, this was years ago he told me this, so, so this is not anything recent, but he said, some of my buddies, they would go out with girls and they had to be with them every moment, and they couldn't be away from them. And he said, they flunked out because they were so busy uh, in their courtships. Uh, another guy, actually a woman, whose brother had gone here to school, um, and that, she came here to school, and she, he gave her my book and she read it, and she said, oh, that's what I want, that's what I want, yeah, that's it. Then she goes back to school and she meets this guy and she, really likes him, and she says, I gotta be with him in every moment, I can't be away from him, I gotta be with him, I gotta be with him. Well, uh, that overflowed into uh, unchastity, and she got pregnant. And uh, the, the, guy got, the guy turned out to be not such a guy, good guy, I think by the time she had the baby, he was in jail. But, um, it, you know, you have to be moderate in all of this, and it's kind of ironic, because I, I was doing a radio show uh, a month or two ago, and I was saying, you know, what we, we have to do is we have to encourage married couples to date more. And we have to date, get asked single couples to date a little bit less. I mean, if you're engaged, you should be able to see someone two or three times a week and maybe talk to them on the phone or text them or whatever uh, a few times a week. But I actually had one couple that were so intense with each other, I said, I think you should practice this. One day a week, don't talk to each other. Don't say any, don't have any communication. Let's just show that you are not codependent, okay? Codependent means, you know, I'm absolutely dependent on you, I can't live my life without you, which is not true. And it's certainly not true for a Christian. Uh, we gotta be plugged into Christ, and everything else is relative, everything else is negotiable. And uh, everything else is an, uh, is an attachment. And attachments are, are dangerous to the spiritual life. Now, uh, women, when you, uh, when you break up with a guy who really liked you, because he did not treat you well, there's a good chance that he will do better with his next girlfriend. And the women say, well, Father, why can't I get him to do it for me? He can't because he's got to get shaken up and he's got to really lose something valuable. He needs a jolt. Many men will not wake up without a strong breakup. So, uh, women tend to, to be very good at loving their husbands. Once they make a commitment, they tend to be very, very good at it. But men, uh, we have to work a little harder at it. And it actually says that in, in, um, in scripture. I think uh, there are about four times in scripture where it says men love your wives. And nowhere in scripture does it say, uh, except in a parenthetical way, women love your husbands. And it doesn't mean that women don't have to love their husbands. It means that love comes more easily to women because women connect to the heart. And men are not as connected to the heart. So to live this way, you need a great deal of grace. Uh, you need to pray. You need to have a strong prayer life. Um, and I strongly recommend the rosary because it's the rosary that I started praying when I was 14 years old. And it's because of the rosary that I'm a priest today, not living with some chick on the beach in Malibu or whatever, uh, thanks to the Blessed Mother. Okay, I'm very grateful for that. 
And so I've been praying it ever since I was 14, and uh, now I pray all the mysteries in, in gratitude to Mary for bringing me to this point in my life. I'm sure a lot of you have heard Dave Favanka speak. I was here this past summer uh, with our youth group for a youth conference. You all know Dave Pavanka? Yeah? No? Yes? No? Oh, he comes here and speaks a lot. Okay. Well, maybe he hasn't been here yet this year. But anyway, he, um, I saw him in the sacristy waiting to get ready to celebrate Mass, and there he had on his finger his ring rosary. Everywhere he goes, he's got this ring rosary going, and I do the same thing. I have the ring rosary going everywhere, uh, and I, I recommend that. It's an easy thing to pray when you're Walking, when you're, you know, walking across campus, you can probably get two or three mysteries said. I, I got two or three said tonight coming down from the, uh, from the, uh, the monastery. What do they call that? Friary. friary the friary. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I strongly recommend uh, the rosary. I, um, what we did, we put together a recording of the rosary with Handel's Messiah in the background, and it's on our website. And there's a little card back there, a um, little a business card that you can pick up that has our website on it. Or you, if you pick up any of our material, it's got our website. Our website is CF Alive, C is in Catholic, F as in Faith, Alive.org. And you can download a free recording of the rosary with all public domain material, but Handel's Messiah in the background of the rosary. I, uh, I often turn sports radio off and pray the rosary with that. Certainly daily Mass, I am told that more than half the people on this campus go to Mass every day. That's great. What about the other half? Okay, everybody consider that. Um, I, I uh, wanted to go to Mass for many years before I ever did it uh, during, the, during the week. And I had prayed about it subconsciously, saying, yeah, I'd like to do that someday. And one day it hit me um, that, I would, uh, that I should go to Mass every day. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll start tomorrow and I'll go to Mass every day for three months. If it doesn't kill me, I'll keep going. Uh, after three months, after three weeks, I felt better. I said, this is great. I feel good. I'm getting up earlier, but I, I'm feeling better. I, I don't miss the sleep. And so I've been going ever since. That was uh, July 29th, 1975. I was six years old. No, I was a little older than that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, confession. We should go to confession at least every month. And we should read the lives of the saints. That's extremely important, to read the lives of the saints. You don't have to read a lot. Five or 10 minutes a day, reading the lives of the saints is great. And um, we actually have a spiritual reading list on our website, and I also left a few of them back there. Probably not enough for everybody, but they're freebies. So, um, but I strongly recommend that you read the lives of the saints. Every time I read the life of a saint, I get converted a little bit more. It's, it's amazing. So. If you want intimacy, I encourage you to hug a lot. And tender goodnight kisses, yes. Uh, if you go for heavy kisses or more, that's mostly pleasure, not intimacy. And it'll be very hard for you to be chased. Uh, so what I strongly recommend is mega hugs and micro kisses in courtship. And that's a great preparation for marriage. <laughs> Thank you.